I'm going to welcome you all. And I, and I believe uh, our cabinet member for finance, Carol Clement Williams, is, is also uh, in the meeting this morning. Uh, I welcome you as well. I know uh, cabinet members who are normal members for this particular uh, board. Um, can I just start off by uh, saying um, good morning and welcome to the meeting of uh, the Regeneration and Sustainable Development Scrutiny Committee on Friday, the 5th of February, 2021. Just to make you all aware, today's meeting will be recorded and Chloe has already started the recording. Can I also welcome any members of the public and press to today's meeting? Can I kindly ask you to observe the meeting only and not to speak or participate? Can I please remind you all to switch your mobile phones to silent for the duration of the meeting? And in addition, can I refer you to the protocols for remote meetings which have been previously circulated? Namely, your microphone should be switched to mute unless you are speaking. Should you wish to ask a question or make a comment, can you please indicate either via the chat function or by raising your electronic hand? I will assume that you have all read the paperwork before us today, prior to the meeting, and please only use the chat function to indicate if you wish to speak as an alternative, you can use the electronic hand function or to raise any other technical issues or use it in the appropriate way, please. When asking the questions, can you please indicate which page number you are referring to? Um, therefore, the first item on the agenda today is to do a roll call. I'm Councillor Steve Hunt, the Chair, and I am here today. I will now call on Chloe, to, the Democratic Service Officer, to take the roll call of uh, uh, everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rachel Taylor. Present. Councillor Dean Corsi. Present. Councillor Chris Jones. Councillor Hugh James. Present. Oh. Present. Councillor Chris Jones is here, so Councillor Hugh James is here. Councillor Sheila Henry. Present. Councillor Sean Percy. Present. Councillor Saifra Harman. Councillor Nigel Hunt. Present. Apologies from Councillor Scott Bamsey. Councillor Jamie Evans. Councillor Simon Noyle. Move on to Cabinet members. Councillor Leanne Jones. Present, Chloe. Councillor Annette Wingrave. Present, Chloe. And uh, we've got Cabinet member, Councillor uh, Carol Kemet Williams. Um, here, uh, so, uh, Chloe, and I'd like to thank the chair for allowing me to sit in today. Okay, officers, Councillor uh, Nicola Pierce. Present, Chloe. Simon Brannan. Present. Kerry Morris. Uh, present, Chloe. Claire Jones. Present, jo Chloe. Mike Shaw. Yes, good morning, Chloe. Davis. Is that Carly Davis? Carly Davis, yes, sorry. Present. Okay. Julia Jenkins. Barrett. Present. And Nicola Heaton. Present, Chloe. Uh, have I missed any officers today? No, I think that's everyone, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. For taking the, the roll call. Uh, item three is the chair's announcement uh, for members and for officers and uh, cabinet members. We have two items to scrutinise uh, in our agenda papers today, and we have chosen to scrutinise. We have not chosen to scrutinise the cabinet board agenda. Um, cabinet papers propose proposal to extend the current service provided by. Oh, sorry. Apologies for that. Uh, we have not decided to to scrutinise the cabinet papers. However, um, we have one item in the cabinet paper that we believe needs to be uh, changed or updated. So uh, without further ado, I, I, I would like uh, just to make reference to it. It's the Substance Abuse Liaison Team, the PSALT, which is on pages 45 to 64. 
and uh, I believe there's a change to this particular uh, 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 paper that's going to cabinet. And Claire Jones, uh, I believe, can update us now this morning. Over to you, Claire. Th thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's the purpose recommendations and the body of the report refer to entering into a grant agreement, a grant agreement with. Uh, um, regarding the SALT service, but it may actually be necessary to enter into two agreements. So the body of the report and the recommendation needs to refer to grant agreements rather than an agreement singular. This is because of the way that the SMAF grant is allocated and because we are in further discussions with our legal services colleagues, we obviously have to make sure that that is right uh, to minimise any risk to the authority. We will, of course, confirm whether it's a grant agreement or agreements that are entered into. Um, I, I hope that's a sufficient explanation. I'm happy to go into further detail if, if there's a necessary, Chair. No, thank you for that, Claire. That's not required. Just for information, members were aware of the changes and they have scrutinised this item. Therefore, they are happy for it to go to Cabinet in, in its current form with the slight update that Claire has referred to. Uh, so th that was that. I, so apologies, I didn't uh, say the two items. The two items is item six, tourism update, and item seven, the consultation 20 to 21, 22 budget proposals. Those are the two items we are only scrutinising today. So um, the next item on the agenda is the minutes of the... Oh, sorry, apologies again. I'm, I'm all at sea today. Uh, item for declarations of interest. Do we have any? No. Excellent. Uh, item five is the minutes of the previous meeting. The item is minuted for approval. Has anyone got any comments on the task minutes? Um, I need a proposal and a second for the minutes. You will find them on pages five to 20. Obviously, these are for accuracy only. They're not for uh, discussion or back or to open up a debate. So um, it's the 4th of December, 2020 minutes. Can I have a proposal for those as an accuracy and a seconder, please? I'll move, Chair. Thank you. No, I second. second. Yeah, great. On the 23rd of December, uh, can I have a proposal and a second for that, those minutes as well? Please? I move, Chair. Thank you, Sheila. Seconder? I'll second. Thank you, Dean. We are excellent. That will take us on to item six, which is the tourism update. I will now hand over to officers Carly Davis and Simon Brennan, who will be providing an update on tourism as requested in our Forward Work Programme workshop. These are on pages 21 to 30. So over to Simon and Carly, uh, whoever's uh, taking it in which order. Simon, I assume first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going to give you a very brief, very brief uh, overview from the report. And uh, as you know, Carly's with us today, who can answer any of the detailed questions on the tourism sector because she knows it better than anybody else. So as you can imagine, it's been a pretty difficult year for tourism generally as it has been with a lot of our uh, our sectors, but the impact on tourism has been significant. Um, the figures that we've got in the report there show a drop in the number of visitors by 63.5%, and uh, the economic impact of that being down by 66.4%. Uh, then Carly notes there that the data doesn't represent a full 12 months, so we have to view it with, with some caution. Um, I think they're figures that wouldn't really surprise any of us, um, given where we've been with lockdowns, etc. And you know, I think it's been interspersed by a, when when they have removed the lockdowns, a, a, a bit of sort of frenzied activity um, in some of our tourism sectors, and that has again brought its issues for some of those areas. But I think the big part of this now is is how we help the tourism sector recover post COVID and the work that we're doing to try and help there. And um, you know, a big part of what we've done in the last sort of 12 months is to 
uh, keep in touch with all of those tourism providers and try and provide some comfort and some support that it will end um, and that things will improve. And it's just really making sure that they can survive this difficult period so that they're there and thriving when it comes back out the other side. Um, also during uh, the COVID period, obviously, um, we've had the business teams um, supporting all businesses across the sector and Carly and the business team have been particularly supporting the tourism sector to make sure that they're able to access all the financial support that is available from uh, Welsh and UK governments, any other grant support that's available. And of course, um, as many of you will be aware, we've had to manage the accommodation approval process for key workers because obviously the hotels have been closed down for certain periods and the only people able to access them then were people who had valid reason for being in the area and being working or uh, occasionally, um, uh, obviously during the difficult period we have now with skewing, where people who suddenly need accommodation need to be accommodated at short notice. Um, to try and keep things going, obviously a lot of collaboration with public sector partners, um, particularly with um, Visit Wales and those meetings have continued and also um, liaison with people like Brecon Beacons National Park to make sure that areas um, like the Waterfall Country are being managed in the best way they possibly can during the pandemic. On top of that then, um, some of the um, business as usual as much as possible has been ongoing. The, um, the refurbishment of the former toilet block facility in Resolven has now been completed and let and will, the occupier will be in place there very shortly. Um, I think we mentioned in one of the last meetings about Avon Forest Park and we were lucky enough to gain some funding there to do a range of different works, including upgrading some existing facilities around the toilets and showers, uh, additional car parking area, electric hookup points for camper vans, uh, a digital information point and lighting, and importantly, a children's playground. Because one of the things that we've identified for many years up there is whilst there is um, uh, good good um, walk walking paths and also uh, obviously mountain bike trails, um, there's been a bit of a gap there where people who um, for whatever reason have remained within the uh, by the information centre and with the cafe uh, there hasn't been a children's playground that would keep those entertained so I think that's a really good step forward. Uh, on top of that obviously the Null, master, uh, Null Park master plan has been completed and a number of other little bits and pieces like some signage down the seafront and also, which isn't mentioned there, we just recently completed the outdoor gym on the seafront. And as soon as we're able to, we we'll obviously remove the fencing and have that open. Um, and that's about it really. Oh, sorry. And there's also the destination marketing, which um, is um, going to be a really important piece of work for us as we come out the other side of, of tourism, of the COVID um, pandemic. We have been holding it back because obviously the last thing you want to do is to launch a, a marketing campaign at this time and then tell people they can't come. It doesn't make any logical sense. So Carly can give uh, a full update on that because I think it's a really interesting piece of work um, and will certainly help us coming out, as I say, coming out the other side. So if you've got any questions, either myself or Carly, happy to take them. Yeah, before I move to questions, there was a number of questions in pre-scrutiny. Uh, Carly, is there anything you would like to add at this point or do you want me to go straight to questions? Thank you. Um, I think it's just worth pointing out with the marketing campaign that um, we, we've been preparing this campaign since the beginning of 2020. It was in planning from in the middle of 2019. It's seen as something which is extremely important um, from the sector's point of view in post-COVID recovery. Alongside a new place, brand new destination websites and marketing campaign altogether are really going to raise the profile of Neath Patolbert. It's a real game changer for our area. Um, and actually, although it's unfortunate we needed to delay the launch of the campaign, it's coming about now at the time when the industry most needs it. We've continued engagement with the stakeholders who, who um, took part in a competitive exercise to be part of the campaign. Um, they've received some training sessions um, in the in November, uh, October or November last year about being involved in the campaign and it's helped everyone to remain positive about what comes after COVID. So I think the industry really does need a little bit of that at the moment. Thank you for that, Carly. 
um, I will go straight to questions now. Uh, I know Sheila, you've got your hand up, but I'll take them in the order, unless it's specific. Uh, I'll take them in the order that was uh, asked at pre-briefing, if you don't mind. Uh, and when I get to you, then you, you'll be fine. Uh, if you can lo lower your hand a second, because you are down as a, as a question asker. So, um, Sean, uh, over to you, please. Come to Sean Percy with the first question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thanks for the report, Simon and uh, and Carly. It's, uh, it's a mixture of uh, sobering reading and some things to look forward to as well. So it's a it's a bit of a tricky time, isn't it? I think in terms of um, COVID impact, um, it would be um, I think interesting for the committee a little bit down the line, perhaps when we're out of the other end of this. Um, to have a little bit of looking back in terms of the impact on the sector, maybe if there's been businesses that have failed or closed and that sort of thing. Um, I think that would be really interesting and, and important for us to look at. Um, so just something perhaps we can we can take a little bit further down the line in terms of how much work there'll be to rebuild that. Um, but more specifically um, on the on the report, um, there has been some good work. So yeah, the seafront signage, really, really welcome. Um, you know, that's useful for locals as well as, you know, a tourism aspect. People who are not that familiar with the beach that might live very nearby um, are, are going to really appreciate that. And I've had a bit of input in, in, into that as well through, through street care. So I'm um, really, really pleased to see that move forward with everything um, that's happening. Um, the, um, the destination website, um, again, we, I think we've had chats about this over the last couple of years, haven't we? You know, it's been a long time in the making. Um, It'd be, uh, I'd, I'd quite like if we can have a little sneak preview at some stage uh, before it goes live. Um, I'm, I'm quite keen to, to see uh, what, what it's going to look like and, and how that's going to work. So if we could sort something out at some stage to have a little look at that, because um, we still have a little bit of time, I think, before we'll be ready to launch. Um, I'd really appreciate that as well. Um, so moving on to the post pandemic um, stuff, looking forward with the uh, destination management plan, because um, that's mentioned there in the report, obviously we've delayed that a little bit in terms of renewing it. Um, I think as a committee, it's something we need to be able to get our teeth into a little bit, um, particularly from my perspective as a newer member, you know, I came on the scene in 2017, we'd inherited the old destination management plan. And it had sort of stalled in a lot of areas because you know we, we didn't have a proper tourism resource at the time and all that's kind of happened um a bit later we've made loads of progress actually since um it was it was it was quite um difficult at the start and we didn't have the resource but now we've got a little small team we've made some progress against some of the the, uh, the points in the plan um but i think um it's key that the committee can get involved at, a, at an early-ish stage um to to feed some of our ideas in just to make sure that you know we've got lots of aspirations and ideas and uh, for the, the whole of the county if, if we can have an opportunity to feed that into the um review and renewal of the plan early i'd really appreciate that so that's just something um if you can take that back when you're planning perhaps how that's going to work I'd, I'd really appreciate it thank you um, yeah, it was as agreed previously um, with this committee, of course, we will have involvement with the committee in the new destination management plan, which just not at a stage where we can think too strategically at the moment. We need to kind of help manage the industry through this stage because it's not over yet. But of course, everything still stands on what was agreed previously. We will be undertaking workshops with with various, you know, with this committee and, and, and other stakeholders as part of the of devising the new master plan. Um, and in terms of your query about looking back um, on the industry, we're quite um, in the position at the moment, I'm not aware of any businesses that have outright failed. Everyone is treading water. How lo much longer they can do so is, is the question. So there will be um, an exercise um, post COVID, whenever that is, uh, to look back at, at the, the the overall impact. Our primary source of data will be the steam statistics. It's what we've got to measure consistently over the last ten years or so, or even longer probably. So um, steam will be the primary focus, but we can definitely look at some qualitative 
information around that of what we're aware of post COVID as well. Councillor Percy, have all your questions been answered or do you want to come back? Uh, no, no, that's great. Uh, thank you, Carly. I appreciate that. Um, I, to be honest, I'd forgotten a little bit what we'd agreed on the destination management plan. It was such a long time ago now um, when we were we were talking about it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just think in terms of the um, looking back at the impact of the businesses of, of, of COVID, I just think the, from the committee's perspective, some of the steam figures can be a bit abstract, can't they? So it's just it might be a bit more useful if we've got because considering the engagement you've got with the businesses is really good. Um, some of that feedback from the businesses and some of the, the real experiences would be really welcome at a later date when it, when it's the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, before we go to the next uh, indication to speak in pre-brief end, I just want to tell Councillor Nigel Hunt, um, you are down to speak, so if it's a question even relating to what you've heard, you can ask it at your time, OK? Thank you. So the next indication was Councillor Sheila Penry, please. Thank you, Chair. I quite agree what on the report the officer gave. This COVID has been a great impact, and especially on tourism, because as you know, the way our hotels are suffering and all the tourism business is suffering. But what the question I would like to put is, you know, with all the projects we've got within the marketing, we've got to be on top now when this is uplifted and the lockdown is uplifted that we are ready with our projects through the marketing that we've got our bids in our grants in that we can move because you haven't got anybody better than i got to say this need to put albert authorities that can give so much to people and i don't know if some of you saw it on television last night on the news the way now they have sold out in Britain in building caravans, camper vans, because they reckon people will be concentrated now more on holidays in Wales and England than they have in the past. They abroad will be very, very dubious for them. So what I would like to say to the officers, I know they're on top of it, but let's get everything ready and let's promote the Put Albert on top that we get all the tourism to Neath Put Albert. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor uh, Sheila. Can, uh, Carly or Simon, I don't think there's a question in there, but uh, I don't know if you want to make a response. Uh, Carly or Simon, Simon, please. I, um, yes, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, I think. Um, it has been, as we've mentioned before, a really traumatic period for the tourism industry. Um, indications are that people might be uh, keener to stay at home for a while and travel within the country. Um, obviously, that brings its own issues in terms of capacity, because uh, you know that that tends tend to be focused a lot of the time around that six weeks period of the the summer holidays for the, the kids in school. So. Uh, uh, you know, we'll we'll have to manage that, I think. And in terms of the effect on businesses, I mean, it's not just those that are immediately um, uh, assumed to be part of the tourism sector, I suppose. I mean, all the pubs and the restaurants and all of those things that that feed off tourists coming in and day trippers and people who stay, um, you know, they're an important part of what we're trying to make, uh, make sure that they can survive through the period as well, because they're a big part of the offer going forward. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Carly, anything to add? Point. Only just to say that absolutely we, we you know we're ready to go with you know two weeks notice really to get the um the campaign up and running. The, the you know the only delay I can see is getting the website live because that can take a bit of time, but the content's already, the campaign is ready. Um the, the you know we we do have to have another look at the stakeholders involved, make sure they are all in a position they're ready, and that will happen, but at the moment, um COVID rates aren't necessarily in a place where we can launch and that can change quickly, can't it? So we are being, we, we you know, we're all over this. It's really important to us. The campaign is something which we, um, is, we've worked very hard on. So we really want to make sure that it's ready to go as soon as the industry needs it. Thank you for that. Sheila, okay? 
the way are. The next indication was uh, Councillor Hugh James, please. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, carry on, Hugh. How are you, team? First of all, Carly, can I say to you, in that job, is baptism by fire. By gosh, you really come in at a tough time and you handle it well. And I really believe, uh, as well, Simon, that when we're ready to go, we go. Um, I think the infrastructure is there, and I'm always pleased that from the leadership down and the cabinet down of this council and all the members, really, that we totally support tourism long term because we've seen this in the lockdown, and we? It's a vital part of the economy, you know, the, the entertainment business, food, whatever. A couple of questions I've got, really. First of all, my question number one is. As far as Visit Wales is concerned, do you think you're both getting the, the support you're getting at this particular time? Uh, the second question is, uh, a vital part of this when we open up from COVID, you can do all this tourism in Newport Albert, but you've got to have some form of infrastructure. I was looking at Kerry there, you know, through planning or environment. We need to, I want to know if you're liaising and keep liaising with both the transport of the Welsh Government, uh, both rail and local private bus companies, which are never easy. And thirdly, I'd like to know that uh, are you liaising, or a plan to liaise, Carly, particularly with you, I do have support of this committee through the chair, I'm sure, that uh, when we can visit these people, we visit them. And I was going to suggest, Chair, that at some further time, when we do open up as a committee, nothing like site visits, was on planning for years, Kerry, that we, as a, as a committee, a very important committee, get out there and visit some of these big businesses as they struggle to reopen. Thank you. Who's taking this first, Simon? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've been very lucky that we've had some good working relationships to visit Wales over the year, over the years, um, indeed. Um, uh, the, our liaison officer was from Neath Port Albert, so he was a local and he understood um, the local economy and the local tourism offer. Uh, he has recently moved on to a different role within Welsh Government, so we'll be establishing links with um, the new appointee very quickly. Um, you know, would we always like more? Uh, absolutely. But I think, you know, we can be very pleased with what we've been able to do with them so far. Um, in terms of um, liaison with businesses, etc. I think it's going to be a really tough time for them over the next sort of six or 12 months, getting themselves back together. But I'm sure um, as soon as they're up and sort of sorted again, they would probably welcome having some um, uh, some 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 maybe a visit and just to show that we support them going forward and that the committee are very supportive of the tourism sector. And I think, um, you know, we've been very lucky. I mean, Carly has done a fantastic job and been supported by Laura as well. Um, and the pair of them, I think, have, have, have really sort of improved things in the last um, two to three years. Thank, thank you, Simon. Carly, are you picking up something Simon might have missed? Yeah. Nothing to add. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Hugh, hey, are you happy with that response? Yes, I am. I think you're doing a good job. And uh, as I say, uh, one of the questions, I'm not going to go further on that today. We can look at this forward with the committee. The secret of any plan for tourism in the future when we lift COVID, we've got to have a decent transport system to get people there. Not everybody's got a car. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hugh. Yeah. Um, next indication was uh, Councillor Nigel Hunt, please. You're on mute, Nigel. Still on mute tonight. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're right now. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to thank Simon and Carly for their reports today on uh, the tourism sector. I think it's highlighted in page 22 how important financially uh, the tour tourism sector is because my figures, it's it's like £112 million a year, which is um, extremely significant and uh, we have to nurture it. I think that I really believe in Neath Patal, but I think it's a it's it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful area, and I think that lockdown really has has made people rediscover our own our, our own beauty, our own landscapes, you know, our, our dunes, our beaches, our rivers, our reservoirs, our mountains, our waterfalls, our landscapes, our sunsets. We've got it all, you, and I think that uh, we've got a lot of potential, and um, <clears throat> I think like what, what Sheila said that we, we we can expect more 
uh, sort of domestic tourism, other people from Wales and the West Country coming to visit us. I think we can expect that. I think we can cash in on it. Like Sean, I would like, really would like to see a preview of the launch of the marketing launch of the website if that would be possible. I'm excited to see that. I think, uh, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> um, and the, 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 I'd see the outdoor gym, Simon, down on the beach. And I think it's a, it's a really, that's excellent. I've always liked what they had done in Mumbles, various parts of London, and they've got those outdoor gyms. Is there any, is there, is there any, will we be rolling out any more of those outdoor gyms through the area, uh, through, throughout the county? I think if you could, you know, I'd, I'd love to have one in Arbor Avon Town Centre, to be honest. Um, or, you know, in, in Avon Argoid or, you know, in numerous places. So, um, I, I, I'd say what, like to reiterate, I enjoyed the report. I think there's hope for us. We've got a wonderful county. You know, let's, you know, come on, let's let's tell people how, how good our area is. It's, it's been a wonderful place to be in lockdown. Um, I took a dip, the cold water treatment thing that's going on. I've been in the Baltic uh, Bromville Reservoir during this lockdown, and I thoroughly was invigorated after being in the cold water. So, um, yeah, I just, I just think that we should really have belief and confidence in ourselves. We've got a great county, and... Uh, Tourism is extremely significant, so um, well done. Thank you for that, Nigel. Again, Simon, there's okay. some perhaps points made, but uh, if you want to respond, please. Just, just um, briefly, I suppose. Well, rather you than me in the water, Nigel, uh, Councillor Hunt. Uh, I'll, leave, <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. Um, I think um, you're right about, um, I think, what we've got to offer. And I suppose one point that we haven't picked up on is how we see the link between our tourism offer um, and particularly, I say tourism, but I mean selling the county borough effectively, which I think the work that Carly's been doing has been very effective at and showing not perhaps the bits that people who don't know the county borough would see when they drive through it every couple of weeks or whatever on the M4, but showing the wider aspects of the county borough and what it has to offer is very important for us in terms of underpinning our economic development offer. Because when we look to attract inward investment, when we look to sell the place as a place that somebody could come and do business. That tourism offer and that selling of the county borough through that is a bit of a critical point. We know that we're changing in terms of um, the way that people can operate going forward, um, particularly insofar as, um, you know, with the way that people operate now through teams as we are today, it does offer people the opportunity to live elsewhere and work in a different place. And again, that sells the county borough because um, in some of our areas and some of the more beautiful areas where perhaps it would have been a, a trip into work, they might now be able to work at home for several days of the week, which is also a boost to the local economies there. So whilst it's really critically important for our tourism aspect, it's also impor important for the wider economic regeneration of the county borough. All right, uh, Nigel, do you want to come back? Are you OK? I'm fine, Steve. I just, um, I just like if if they were, if we are going to do any more outdoor gyms, I'd like to be kept in the loop. Going so, sorry, I missed that point. Um, yeah, we'll we'll we you know that we'll see how the one goes in the seafront. I think it'll be very well received. Um, and if they can be, um, obviously that one we got funded through the contractor who was doing work on the seafront. Um, but there's no reason if they're well received why we can't replicate that elsewhere. Either you know, as you say, in Margan Park or Avnar Guide in various different places. Subject to space, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dean Causey, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and um, I want to echo, first of all, everything that's been said and the great work that's uh, is happening. And, uh, you know, me, I'm a big believer in tourism. Um, I've got a few questions. They're all kind of related. Uh, naturally, they, they're all sort of centred on uh, plans for when thing when when restrictions are, are lifted but um so the first question is really something you may or may not know and, I, and i'll preface my questions really by by, by saying uh some of this is covered in, in the report and and you know you're not going to know the answers probably or certainly it's not in your gift um some of it but but i'll ask anyway so do, are we aware of any organizations particularly the larger tourism organizations that have applied for the uh, the Economic Resilience Fund? Uh, has it been well received? Are there problems with, with eligibility? Um, uh, you could could we sort of, um, uh, are we working with Welsh Government to, to try and um, uh, improve that? Um, related to that then, I suppose, 
a, a plan for when restrictions are, are, are eased. We've we've talked about uh, destination management um, plans and, and organisations, but um, I, I know for argument's sake the Wales Tourism Alliance are talking about concerns that we're going to have an avalanche of visitors actually. You know, come come April, May, June, July, uh, and actually, even though we all sit there and we say this is marvelous and this is great and let's let's market it for Talbot, I think there were a lot of communities last year that that were that were felt a bit threatened. I think um, by the arrival of an avalanche of visitors, and and that could be replicated, you know, twofold this year. Uh, I think so. I wondered whether there was any sort of thinking around that, uh, around managing. Uh, communities' fears, uh, and maybe if there was scope to apply for funding, I'm thinking of the 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 RF, but other funding, or or you know whether whether we're able to do it, or perhaps support organisations to do it, to maybe employ like community liaisons or or guides or something, um, and wh- whether then we're doing some work not only with Welsh government, but but. English local authorities, perhaps with Westminster, um, because obviously, you know, we have an eighty percent dependency on on English tourism in Wales uh, and on the English market. Um, uh, one but last question uh, is: Do do are we aware of any sort of shortages on skills? Perhaps because people have moved on. To different jobs during this time, they become unemployed and, and, and change careers, or or perhaps because the skills training hasn't been there. Uh, and also, are we aware of um, any labour shortages? Dare I say it, because of Brexit uh, and, and and things around that, and international movement maybe. Uh, and then finally, 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 uh, is there any plan in terms of like? events or festivals you know i think there's going to be an eagerness in there particularly in communities uh to have you know your, your carnivals your summer fates this sort of stuff are we thinking in that sort of way or is, or is, or, or is that not 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 you guys remit um sorry a bit long-winded but uh thank you <laughs> as usual <laughs> dean uh, no excellent questions uh i'll be touching on a couple of the points you raised anyway myself but uh, i i'll go to simon now for a, a response thank you I, I'll desperately try and remember all of those uh, all of those um, questions, um, and I'll bring Carly in on some of them as well. In terms of, I mean, obviously we can't comment on individual cases in terms of the grant funding, um, but I would say across the board, the majority of it has been exceptionally well received. Um, I think the team has done exceptionally well in getting tourism money out to the various different sectors. As ever with these things, there'll be some that don't qualify for whatever reason. Um, and you know, there's always some winners and losers. There's probably some who got more than they expected, others who got significantly less than they would have hoped for. And it is a difficult time. And I, Carly can have a little come in on that at the end. And particularly on the, um, I know we, I know what you mean about the tourism and the marketing, and that's why we've held back with the with the marketing proposals because it is very difficult to and persuade people to come to the area whilst telling them they can't come to the area it, you know it doesn't make any logical sense does it and we had a few uh you know discussions with um brecon beacons national park for example last year around waterfall country because we weren't marketing waterfall country um and other than sort of trying to close it off i mean it does cause some problems you've seen it there you've seen it in the um in uh, in the beacons for example where people are turning up and anecdotally from our colleagues down in West Wales, we know there are a number of communities down in West Wales who are very unhappy with the level of tourists coming into the area. Um, and that's a difficult point to process to manage because obviously a lot of people there rely on their, their, their livelihoods. But there are a lot of locals who not maybe involved in the tourism industry who really don't want to see hordes of people turning up in their small town or village. So it is a really difficult one to manage um in terms of skill shortages i think i think that we're probably okay as far as i'm aware at the moment i su- i suspect there will be people who have left the industry because they've moved on elsewhere they've found other jobs um but it um, i mean as ever with the tourism sectors 
it tends to be quite transient anyway and you will get people in and out of it because that's the way that the economy works um i'm not sure i even want to comment on brexit and what that will bring us um you know i suppose everybody has their own view on how successful uk government are with brexit and um you know hopefully everyone will want to come and see our sovereignty um because that's probably the only thing we've got left um but i think the last question then i Sorry, I've scribbled something down, but I can't even read what I've written in the last question. Uh, Dean, you can remember the last one? It was events and uh, festivals. Oh, events, events and festivals yeah. fit. We, we, as a, you know, as, as an authority, we are not at this stage taking on any more events. Um, we are in the position where we will need to make decisions very soon on some of the larger scale events that we hold every year, things like Neath Fair, things like um, the Food and Drink Festival in Neath, um, because we're at that point, at that critical point very shortly where we have to have the planning process in place. It takes us around about four or five months to ramp up to these events because of the way that they're, they're held. So um, I think we'll be watching the situation very closely. What we ideally don't want to do is to end up committing money to these things and then have to cancel them towards the last minute. But it's very difficult to predict at the moment quite what the position will be perhaps in the summer, late summer. We're all hoping that, um, you know, we'll be in place with the vaccination process, etc. that things will have been relaxed and people will feel more comfortable. But, you know, as, as ever, those large scale events involve an awful lot of people in very close proximity. And the other point on that is whether people would be comfortable doing it, even if we held the event, would the public come? Would they want to be in very close proximity to others? So, and that obviously for traders point of view, coming down to things like the September Fair, coming down to the Food and Drink Festival, they rely on a pretty healthy footfall to make their visit worthwhile. And what we wouldn't want to do is to have sort of half an event, if you like, which was not very well attended. And then they think maybe next year they wouldn't want to attend. But I'll hand over to Carly now for um, to pick up any of those points. Carly. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to go back through the, the list of questions again. Um, on economic resilience, but that's just one in a wide range of different pots of funding that businesses can apply for. So um, it, it all depends on whether you're eligible, whether you've got a valuation from the valuation office, pay business rates, receive rates relief, whether you're self-employed. There's lots of, um, it's a bit of a minefield, but we one of the reasons why we focus so much on providing advice to businesses is to help them to navigate that minefield a little bit. The latest round of economic resilience fund was probably the one which would make would be would have mopped up those which weren't eligible before because over a certain threshold, which some of our hotels fell into um, over the valuation of 150,000, they meant they couldn't access funds prior to that. And I know that some of them have. Um, the ones that are, are kind of left um, struggling at the moment are the small single self catering operators who don't meet the criteria on 50% um, of the more not earning more than 50% of the income from that small self catering unit, or they're not registered for business rates, and they have to meet additional criteria in terms of providing accounts for a certain number of years. But we, you know, where that's happened is very small number of businesses, but that's the only ones that we know of that uh, are kind of left out at the moment from the discretionary funds, from the, the more formal economic resilience fund as well. Um, looking at the potential of, you know, the over demand, we're calling it just during the, you know, the summer months, there is, yeah, definitely a touch on in my report, definitely the potential to be overwhelmed, but this is demand like we've never seen before and demand which can't be predicted. Although we aren't carrying out any marketing activities at the moment, none of our partners are, not even Visit Wales. Um, the social media impact of people visiting areas and Bromville Reservoir is a perfect example of that, where we've never promoted Bromville Reservoir, but over the summer it was like, you know, trending, it wasn't trending, that's exaggeration, but it was very popular on Instagram and it caused some pretty major issues for the people who live close to there. And managing that's really difficult because we've got no impact on those people who are sharing and 
referring on social media, but we are working with our partners, Natural Resources Wales, Waterfall Country with Brecon Beacons as well, to try and manage the messaging that's put out and some of the stuff on the ground as well. We're working quite hard on that. Funding, you mentioned funding. I think um, we're very hard to know what the funding landscape is going to be like post COVID. I, I may have just written that down, I don't know if you asked that. Um, shortages of skills um, and labour shortages is a difficult one to predict at a time when people are letting go of staff rather than looking for them. There's always been a labour shortage in terms of chefs um, and service uh, staff in the hospitality sector. That's probably, well, there's an opportunity there for the tourism and hospitality sector post-COVID, I think, to try and help recruit some of those people who have been, um, who, who sadly lost their jobs during the COVID pandemic. Events and festivals then, um, you may remember back when the tourism team was established as part of our, um, our budget, we had an allocation of um, a small, a very small allocation for an event fund. The intention was that would launch with the new destination management plan. When I say small, it's small, but that could potentially be part of the help once we're ready. Events and festivals will be the last thing probably to recover from, from COVID, if I'm honest. But we've got a small bit of support there to try and help with that when the time is right. Okay, Dean, uh, do you want to come back? Yeah, yeah just very briefly, Chair. Thanks very much for that, both of you. And, you know, I do appreciate that you can't answer some of those questions. I thought it was just worth mentioning to, to really, you know, the flag up some of these issues really for everyone. But just to come back to two things. Funding, of course, yes, I'm well aware of the, the non-domestic rates grant and the furlough scheme and all this sort of stuff. But I just wanted to particularly ask about the um, the the economic resilience fund because I'm getting a lot of feedback um, from from you know from my part and beyond that there are some issues with, with the criteria specifically on things like having to be VAT registered and and, and the PAYE uh, criteria that's having a bit of an impact you know perhaps on like um, you know uh, um, an outward bound sort of small organisation you know it's just a solo soul train type of thing the smaller sort of pubs i just 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 interested in that but the other thing i want to pick up on was most more importantly you mentioned waterfall country i'm well aware of, of the massive uh, influx of visitors that that place had so i was just interested on if we had a bit of a leadership role to play working with uh, the breckbeekers national park to try and tap into some of these funding so, some of this funding to maybe have i don't know how it would work but perhaps one or two people that we could deploy there, you know, on a weekend to direct cars, you know, to hand out hand sanitizers, masks, whatever, cordons, whatever it might be. So I, 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 that, that was sort of my thinking specifically. I know you probably can't answer that, so no need to um, prolong the, 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 the conversation, uh, Chair. Thank you, Carly, very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Dean. Uh, appreciate that. Um, any other member got a, a question on the tourism update that I haven't indicated? No, um, I just have a, a just a, a little couple. I certainly support. Uh, hold on, Nigel, have you raised your hand before me? Nigel, you want to come back? Yes, uh, if I could, Chair, I just want to yeah. make something brief for Carly and Simon. Um, are you aware that there's like been a hot uh, heritage lottery grant for an arts trail in Patalbert? And they're doing some good work around that. Have you been in contact with them? Uh, yeah, that okay. Good. All right. I, the, I think the indication is yes. So if you want to have a discussion with that, Nigel, with the officers, by all means. Um, just a couple of points from here. Councillor Percy raised the destination management plan, I, I, and he's asked the questions. I've received the answers to that, so I'm satisfied. Uh, Dean went into uh, other issues. Um, I. I'm aware of the active travel plan that uh, Kerry uh, uh, was uh, probably, before he moved on to his new uh, role as uh, head of planning, was uh, very much in, in, in the process of carrying that out uh, with Nicola and so forth. Um, we know we got it on our forward work programme for scrutinising, but um, I've been, well, I don't know how long I've been chair of this meeting now, perhaps two or three years, uh, Prior to that, I was a member of this committee for many, many years. That active travel plan, uh, uh, it, not, notwithstanding COVID, of course, uh, 
very slow deliverance not maybe in the in the the, the towns or, or or so forth but up up to the valleys because you know I, I don't want to be parochial but there was a there was a bit of an active travel plan in Sam sisters that uh, that ha- nothing's moved and I and I know we can scrutinize items within agendas forevermore uh, obviously our role and job is to see outcomes and see deliverance and end products to anything that we scrutinize that's our objectives of course and and i do appreciate some roll over and continue to work but uh, i just want to briefly ask you know where we go in with this active travel plan i know we're going to scrutinize it so i don't want a long drawn out uh, answer gary or from carly or, or segment and uh, my other one point i was going to raise is um well sort of touching on council causes points about um grants and so forth. I think this authority uh, does an exceptional job uh, of, of uh, getting the grants that we need to improve Neath and Talbot for all our con- communities and constituents. There's no doubt about that. I, I, I would suggest, and I don't know about the other authorities, but we're definitely one of the best in Wales in, in achieving that. Uh, I, I, I do appreciate uh, the, the complexities and given COVID and other issues, whether we have the capacity to 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 continue in that way, but but what I would like to see, and I know you are doing it, because I've been directly involved myself and been very successful. But just touching on, there was a seminar last night or a, or a teams meeting for the leader grant. You know, encouraging uh, communities to try and uh, use this money in the right in the right way before it goes back to Welsh government. Now. It's laborious. The, the grants I know because uh, only because I've got experience and I've worked with officers, I'm lucky to have that ability. But community groups and charities will not have anybody within that group to be able to advise or help. We do to a certain degree, but we can't take any applicant through the process to its completion. Now, it's very, very difficult. And I, uh, you know, I'm having this from experience. Uh, we, we may lose money or it goes back because they can't claim it. So I, I'm asking, is there a way through our officers that we can try and make simplify then? Uh, I, I know they've got to follow certain criteria and protocols and, and you have to be satisfied, uh, you know, long term um, uh, longevity and uh, sustainability. But we need to try and find a way so community groups, charities and other organisations are able to use the funding available to deliver in the communities without the council uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but I'm just asking, you know, you, you're experts in this field. Uh, is there a way of, of, of producing something going forward, whether it's a Teams meeting seminar that, that or changing it? Or, or talking to West government to change it. Uh, so it's just those two little points on the funding and the active travel project, I call it. Thank you. Kerry, you had your hand up first. So I'll come to you first, and uh, then I'll come to Nicola and then Carly. Uh, over to you, Kerry. Thank yeah, th- thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll maybe just briefly come back on the uh, to the active travel specific points. Um, yeah, j- j- just to clarify, there will be a report come in um uh, to this committee for 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 members to scrutinize in terms of giving members an update um of where we have spent the active travel money monies that we've been awarded and and how we've moved the active travel agenda on we would have brought one of course uh at at sort of march april time last year but of course COVID happened so so essentially the next report that members will see will effectively cover um a a two-year period um, in terms of the, the active travel maps, uh, members will be aware that we, we, we do have the integrated network map in place. Um, it, it is a mixture of sort of short, medium and long term routes, some of which are aspirational. Um, we, we did, when we prepared the initial map, we did make a conscious decision to put a lot of aspirational routes in so that we could seek to sort of link better our sort of valley communities, which which are sort of uh, dispersed throughout the valley communities uh, and subsequently based on the active travel map we have subsequently put in bids to Welsh government to, to to seek to gain funding to deliver those schemes but to date at least 
we've not been successful um, in those particular um, uh, particular sort of bids because the feedback we've had from Welsh government and Welsh government ministers is that I think at the moment at least they're trying to just get the numerical advantage of having schemes within the, the main centres of Neath, Ponadawe and Port Talbot and, and as a consequence um, you know communities in the valleys like Seven Sisters and others perhaps uh, lose out and are not pro being prioritised at the moment. Um, all that said, um, the active travel map is being looked at and reviewed again this year. Um, and I think that there's been uh, more guidance issued that, that hopefully provides a little bit more flexibility in terms of what routes uh, councillors can put forward. And, and then hopefully then once we get through that process and, and, and obviously members of this committee will will see the iterations of that map as we bring it forward. It will then provide a basis to have more successful schemes, particularly in the valley areas where um, you know, we would look to, to, to deliver those schemes. But, but ultimately, the experience we've had to date is that I think the Welsh Government are prioritising the main centre so they can deliver very much numerical advantages of, of the active travel. I think there's been a lot of scrutiny at their end in terms of the money that has been spent on the active travel agenda and what added value and added benefit it's providing. So that's why we suspect that the Welsh Government has focused on, on the town centres. Uh, I don't know whether Nick wants to add any more on that particular issue. Yeah, thank you for that, Kerry. Uh, uh, Director of uh, Environment, uh, you did have your hand up, Nicola. I, you yeah. took it down, but uh, would you like to come in at this point? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just to add on, um, where, where Kerry um, referred to the active travel routes, we have in the past put forward um, proposed routes and um, we have been knocked back, unfortunately, because as Kerry mentioned, um, the amount of people or the population within those areas wasn't sufficient to demonstrate the value for money uh, being spent on those routes. Um, we've also had our hands tied behind our backs in terms of the, the um, criteria associated with active travel. I think we've probably mentioned in this um, this meeting previously that the active travel sort of objectives were set up to establish sort of commuter routes via an alternative mode of transport. So they were trying to get people to go to school and go to work and possibly go shopping and other, for other sort of associated journeys via an active travel route rather than driving. Um, and we were specifically advised they were not recreational routes. Now, we all know that we want to expand our network for recreational routes because when you get somebody on a bike, um, to, for recreational purposes, you're sort of introducing them to the bicycle, and you know, and and hopefully, during periods of good weather, the you know the enjoyment they can get from um, using a bicycle to get from A to B. And sometimes you need to have that experience to enable them to then consider using it for commuting purposes. So we think that sort of the recreational use of bicycles is intrinsically linked to the commute, the use for commuting, and we have spelt that out several times to Welsh government. Now we we have um, recently been made aware that the Welsh transport strategy is being reconsidered to have um, sort of a, um, to consider the rural offer, and it has been mentioned that uh, you know, our rural areas possibly have been left behind for the reasons that Kerry said, because they haven't got huge numbers of population in those areas, so they're not necessarily hitting the numerical target. Um, it seems as if Welsh Government has sort of um, I, I understood that more, and we're hoping that as a consequence of that consultation, it may well sort of open up the opportunities to our less densely populated areas, i.e. rural areas, and we can hopefully expand the network going forward to not only address commuting, but also recreational routes as well. Um, we're not holding our breath at the moment, but there does seem to be a chink of light in that in that area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Nicola and Kerry. Uh, before I bring Carly in, um, just, just a quick response. I, I understand everything you're saying and, I, and the, 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 the process that it, is, it involves. Uh, I, I was only making reference to it because there's other plans that that they overlap into, of course, and uh, the just again a, a bit of parochialism, but the, the schools within the, the Delice Valley are linked 
Crainant uh, pupils use a census to school. Uh, so when you mention cycling, we probably got one of the most dangerous roads in the borough, and that's the, the road that leads from Crainant to St. Sisters. Many fatalities over the years, and even a lot more accidents that will be on the, the police records and uh, accident reports. So I just wondered, you know, uh, sometimes you, we have to serve. I understand all the complexities and where Welsh Government goes with it, but sometimes that's why people of the valleys feel that they, they either miss out or are left behind to a certain extent. So I'm only highlighting it. And in fairness, Kerry and, and Nicola, we will have the opportunity in this uh, this committee uh, with that forward work programme uh, item when it comes to us. So apologies for that. Uh, Carly, over to you, because my second question, I assume you are going to answer. Thank you. Yeah, just to pick up on the query about the leader funding, um, I sit on the local action group as the tourism representative and, and just to say that I'm aware they have simplified the application process in, on the understanding that you know small community groups are finding the process difficult. So funding under a certain threshold is now a very short application process and they have got officers in post in that team to help the community groups and they, and they do quite intensively support them to um, complete their applications and, and, and all the way through to project delivery as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I just felt that the time is running out, uh, I believe, before the, the money goes back. Uh, I think that was the point that a lot of the groups have made to myself and others. So uh, I, I, and I don't know if, if you did have 10 or 20 people or commit uh, groups, sorry, come into the council for support, you'd have the capacity to support them. Uh, that that was the, the sort of point I was trying to make. But thank you for that, Carly. I, I, I'm glad it's simplified and maybe other types of grants can be simplified in the same way going forward. Uh, Councillor Nigel Hunt, uh, you want indicated you wanted to come in on this point? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, it's just quite brief, really. Um, I know that with the active travel, that the Welsh Government are um, prioritising areas when numerically it would add up. And um, I, I really think there's a glitch in between Patalba Town Centre and Aberavon Beach. Of course, they're talking about the old Dock Road and New Bridge Road um, with cyclists. I mean, this is a real... Uh, a, a lot of cyclists are affected, really, with the cycle path. Is there any sort of plan where we could get a crossing, a cycle crossing from over the River Avon Closer to the to the to the, to the seafront, because um, the traditional route, of course, was over the new bridge, bridge which has now been closed. So um, even if it was just a small bridge, like the half penny bridge that we have by Blancos, or that you have numerous bridges like this up, um, up uh, you know, in Carmarthen, just so we can get a bike across, is there anything there? And surely that would pay feed into what the Welsh government are looking for when it, in terms of numbers, because that's quite a built up area. Carly, before you answer that, uh, let me bring in Councillor Sean Percy as well. Uh, before I come to you and Kerry, just in case he wants to add a, a few other points to that uh, question. Uh, Councillor Percy, please. Thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm quite conscious we're straying wildly off the agenda, um, but given the questions being asked, um, it's slightly outside the remit of this committee in one, in one sense. Um, th there is a there is a plan that, that I'm working on with engineering and highways at the minute that is happening obviously outside the remit of this committee and um, which I can update Nigel on um, but it's uh, slow going in relation to the existing bridge maybe Kerry might want to come in on the active travel side but we are looking at um, a better diversion uh, route for the bridge currently and I think it's subject to a bid in the latest round of funding um, so the team's been working on that so hopefully one way or another we'll be in a better position with that uh, problem soon. Thank you for that, Councillor Percy. I, 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 and you're right, it, yeah, it's sort of in a bit and straying a little bit, but Nigel's asked the question. Uh, so, Kerry, if uh, uh, you or Carly first, or Kerry, I'll come to you first then. So, no, I think I think this is this one's for me, uh, Chair, not not necessarily Carly. <laughs> right, okay. uh, yeah, just, just, just simply to add from what, what Councillor Percy has just covered, um, just to, to make Councillor Hunt aware that, that there has been a, a recent uh, initial consultation on uh, the active travel uh, maps. It is one of three separate consultations, and we've had a very, very good response uh, to the initial consultation. 
whereby a, a lot of individuals, a lot of people have suggested uh, opportunities for routes in and around uh, the county borough, a, a lot within the Aberavon and Sandhills area. So there's a lot of options to consider going forward. Um, and and uh, you know we you know the team will I have no doubt councillor involve you as those schemes and potentially come forward as part of that that mapping process. Thank you for that, Kerry. Sure. All right, Nigel. Nigel. Yes, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Kerry, for the response. And uh, yeah, it'd be grateful to be kept in a loop with, with with regards to that. Thanks. I think the tourist update, it is only an update, so it's, it's not for a propose. Uh, so I think that's a real good area. Um, if we move on to item seven, uh, this is the consultation now on the 2021-22 budget proposals. I assume that officers may want to give a brief update on the report, highlighting the specific budget area that fall in line with regeneration and sustainable development scrutiny remit to enable the committee to feed into the consultation. Uh, we will then go to questions. It's on pages 31 to 42. Um, I was given a little note as well, so that uh, obviously I think members would be aware, but for the meeting, uh, it is a legal requirement for the council to set a balanced budget. So if there are any comments or proposals to alter or reduce existing elements of the budget, they must be replaced by other viable income generation or saving strategies. However, just on that point, can I just mention that it's not just from today's meeting. The consultation is still open. Uh, we have the cabinet fi fi financier. I'm sure she would take any emails uh, from members uh, alluding to any savings or or other ways of dealing with the budget. And of course, Howell Jenkins is always at the end of an email as well. So it's, it's not just from today's meeting with the questions. It's an ongoing process until we get to the budget set in, uh, in early March. Um, so uh, I'll go over to uh, whoever's taking this item for a brief update. I got Kerry's hand up. Uh, Kerry, it's you who's doing this today. Yeah, over to you then, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's well. It's it's it'll be a bit of a double act. It will perhaps be between myself and Simon. So, uh, given that Simon's had a bit of a grilling on the tourism report, I'll uh, I'll happily go first and, and maybe cover my elements, and then I'll pass over to Simon, and then obviously more than happy, Chair, to take take any questions. Um, as I said, I won't I won't dwell on 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 the broad aspects of the report, and you've adequately covered those in your your introduction, but. What this report essentially does is provide members with a little bit more supplementary information in terms of um, the pressures that that we've identified within our service areas um, and indeed the risks that we're potentially looking to carry forward that have not necessarily been um, sort of picked up um, in, in, in the pressures going forward. Um, in terms of the total figure, in terms of the pressures outlined in the report, um, there's a figure of 579 uh, K, um, uh, which relate to the services that are uh, overviewed by, by this scrutiny committee. Um, the the good news is that there's no proposed cuts in terms of the budget for, for either planning and protection or indeed property and regeneration. But just to give you some brief commentary on, on the identified service pressures, um, uh, there, are three there are three identified in the report, uh, two of which relate to uh, the next financial year, 2021-22. And then the, the second one, the LDP, which I'll touch on in a moment, uh, relates to, to the following subsequent financial year. But just very briefly, Chair, um, the uh, the cost pressures for the Planning Public Protection Service amount to uh, 30k for, for next financial year. Uh, the first one is um, for the Asset Sponsorship Management Service. Uh, members will be aware that this scheme has been in place for some time. Uh, where there's an opportunity for local companies to sponsor council assets and promote their businesses. Now, we anticipate that the income generated from this service will be significantly affected. In fact, you know, we're already seeing evidence of that uh, because of perhaps the financial impact that the pandemic will have on businesses and their ability to sponsor uh, the council's assets. So we've we've identified a pressure of, of 15K for the next financial year, which reflects what we consider to be uh, the anticipated gap in income generated uh, below what we've what target threshold we have uh, for for 2021-22. Uh, 
the second uh, second uh, pressure relates to the the enabling natural resources and well-being grant the, or, or more widely known as the NRO grant um, now the issue here is that um, the Welsh government have and continue to to assess their funding commitments and priorities in, in particularly in light of of the COVID pandemic um, and where as a consequence of that the, the countryside and wildlife team have yet to receive confirmation of whether what amounts to quite a substantial bit of funding has been successful or not um, for example the initial grant uh, the report highlights that the initial grant amounted to uh, 2.42 uh, million over three years um, of which uh, 981k was was direct spend for this council um, as is the nature of the countryside and wildlife service um, a lot of project delivery and indeed staff costs are very much dependent on grant funding generally uh, and the identified pressure of 15k in next year sort of reflects the fixed staff costs that are uh, to be identified and funded out of this current unconfirmed grant so that's that pressure um, and just quickly chair on, on, on the local develop, development plan, um, although there's not a pressure uh, identified for next year, primarily because, um, because of the delays in the formal commencement of the LDP process, there is currently enough funding within uh, the LDP reserve to, to meet the projected spend for next year. Um, but the report does highlight, Chair, in the appendix that there is uh, a 100k pressure identified for 2022-23, which ultimately will cover the ongoing costs commitment for, for LDP preparation. Um, in terms of uh, just two, two elements to briefly flag for members today in terms of risks to be carried forward um, that, that are not necessarily reflected in, in the pressures uh, that we're discussing today. Um, the first one relates to the, to the test, trace and protect service and indeed the very closely linked COVID enforcement officer workforce. Now, the current position is that the TTP workforce is fully funded until the 31st of March via the Welsh Government and partially funded for the duration of the first quarter of 21-22 up to the end of June. Um, with the COVID enforcement workforce, uh, they're currently only fully funded until the 31st of March. Now, the COVID enforcement workforce are are currently funded out of the local authority hardship fund uh, and we have received confirmation that that particular funding pot won't be extended into 21-22 so we are currently in uh, conversations and pressure is being very much applied to the welsh government to uh, confirm what their uh, expectations are of both ttp and indeed the covid enforcement workforce into next year and my personal view, Chair, it's a little bit disappointed to say the least that we're still, now that we're already in February, in a position where there is still a great deal of uncertainty in terms of how that workforce will be funded going forward. So we're very much awaiting confirmation from that. Uh, and very much linked to that, uh, the last point I wish to raise, Chair, is, is uh, the, um, the ongoing uh, risk carried forward in terms of the, the environmental health and training standards teams and uh, in terms of the backlog of the business as usual work. Um, members will of course be aware that the service has been very much deployed at the front line in terms of the council's wider response to the pandemic um, and as a consequence of that there's now been a sort of a backlog of business as usual work that has built up over time. Now the report chair sort of flags some of the examples of where that work backlog has, has developed. I won't necessarily go through them albeit I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, but moving forward, Chair, there's probably going to be a need to look at how we deploy resources to address that backlog as we hopefully move into the recovery phase uh, from the pandemic. And, and that will very potentially involve the temporary recruitment of staff to deal with that, that backlog. Um, so that, that's the main points I wish to raise, Chair, and I'm, I'll perhaps pass over now to Simon uh, to deal with his areas. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Kerry. Uh, Simon, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've identified in property and regeneration over the next three years cost pressures of around 549, 549,000. Uh, the first one that I'll pick up is around decarbonisation measures. Um, obviously, um, members will be aware of the uh, decarbonisation and renewable energy, the DARE strategy, um, <clears throat> and potentially in, um, in, in, in the not too distant future, we'll be looking at a plan 
that effectively takes us towards carbon neutral going forward. Um, these are going to be two big things, not only on the authority's agenda, but I think the wider agenda throughout the UK for all public sector organisations. Um, we've installed uh, um, a number of EV charging points, both for our own fleet, and our own fleet is growing in terms of uh, EV vehicles, um, but also we're looking to introduce them into the community as well. And we're doing a piece of work at the moment, um, hopefully via the city deal, where we will have a new strategy, not only for Neath Patal, but, but for the Southwest Wales region, because I think it's very important that we combine as local authorities in Southwest Wales to make sure that anybody who's interested in coming into our area, and this relates back to the tourism point earlier on, really, is able to travel freely through the area and they don't hit not spots, if you like, um, where they can't charge their vehicles. So as a consequence, whilst um, we just mentioned earlier as well in the tourism, we're going to get some charging points up in um, Avon Forest and they're very welcome. But of course, these things need to be maintained as they go forward. So we need to put something in the budget that allows us to do that. Um, so that will increase uh, from 50 to 100K going forward. Um, the second point then, I mean, is around um, reduction in our income based budget at the moment. As you know, we rent out an awful lot of properties from industrial units, um, some retail premises, uh, some offices, and we've had to give uh, rent free periods for some of those over the last uh, over the last 12 months to make sure these businesses can continue to to operate going forward, because that's a big part of of why we have them, obviously. Um, and that obviously comes at a cost and particularly then for where businesses may not be able to survive or have decided that they're going to operate in a different way and have released their premises and we haven't held people to those leases really going at the, at the present time because of the difficulties they're in uh, it's probably slightly more difficult to relet premises so we just had to make provision in the budget for the next um, 12 months for 250 that will then decrease then by 150k down to 100k for 22 23. Um, going forward then a specific one around crown buildings that building will come back to us um, the contractors will have finished and we're doing the handover in the next week or two um, obviously as soon as that happens because it's now in a position where it could be let um, we'll be liable for non-national non-domestic rates uh, that's currently around about 79k for the half of the building that we um, that we retained. So we just need to make provision for that. That'll cover the period until hopefully we can get a letting on that during this uh, this next year. This is the next one. The additional town centre offices is something that's come up previously, and I think we've discussed. Um, we currently operate with one officer who looks after all our town centres. Obviously, Neath, Port Albert, Pontedawe, and tries to help out in the uh, in the valley ones, uh, the smaller town centres, wherever possible. But that is a pretty thankless task for one officer, uh, and something that unfortunately they're not able to achieve. Um, so, what we've um, been speaking about, and um, uh, our current chief, our new chief executive, Karen, has been very supportive as well, is getting some more support into the town centres to make sure that we've got people who can address problems that arise during the working day now it's not going to be obviously if we've got there we're talking about two additional officers to cover neath port albert pontedowie and the valley communities so they can't be everywhere all the time but it will be a really good start to make sure that we've got people who can respond to problems that arise during the day what we're hoping there is that they will be able to liaise with um, other parts of the council um, be it traffic enforcement could be street care just to identify problems during the day, but also to deliver liaise as well with the police where there are problems identified within town centres and to deal with them as swiftly as possible. So they won't be a sort of community policing presence, if you like, uh, because they won't have that authority. But what they will be able to do is to be our eyes and ears on the um, within the town centres and to liaise with our colleagues in CCTV, CCTV for example, to pinpoint problems that might come on, but also to liaise with businesses, because I think you know a number of businesses are going to need a bit more support going forward. I mean, obviously, with things like Neath Market, we've had somebody on the door there to prevent numbers going in over the last um, sort of nine months, 
Um, so there's all sorts of little bits and pieces that need to be done. And I think it would be a really good step forward and a really good visible presence in our town centres to show the support that we've got for town centres and for their economic recovery. Um, the last identified pressure there is some additional capacity within um, region economic development and business support. Um, the, the numbers, the, the staff numbers within those areas have reduced significantly um, from the heyday, perhaps about seven or eight years ago. Um, we do run it on pretty much a shoestring, and that does cause problems occasionally in terms of capacity because we haven't got capacity to get involved uh, as much as we would like in regional projects. And there are pieces of work that sometimes we would like to get done, but find it very difficult. Um, we don't really have capacity to lead on a lot of regional projects because we don't have the numbers there to do it. So um, what we look in there is to provide a bit of additional support into those areas because as members will be aware, for those who are, um, were able to attend the poverty symposium, for example, going back what seems a long time ago now is probably about 18 months, two years, um, when we were able actually able to meet face to face. Um, and that clearly identified that the economy is a critical factor in obviously reducing poverty, but also in helping to alleviate some of the social problems we get within our county borough. So I think the economy is going to be a problem going forward. We've got not only the pandemic, but Brexit is going to cause us some problems. We've already had businesses who've identified concerns associated with that. So I think we've got to put ourselves into the best possible position we can be to help support those sectors of the economy that need support going forward. So that was just uh, an additional sort of support within that. I think um, going on to the risks going forward and just staying with that business support and economic development sector for a second. As I say, whilst the 100K is exceptionally um, well received and we are very, very grateful for that, we're also mindful that that really that we're still not in comparable position to colleagues, for example, in Swansea and in Carmarthen, who have significantly larger sections that deal with this. And so we do flag up that it could be as things progress, there may be additional support required in those areas. And similarly, going back to decarbonisation, uh, if we are going to be carbon neutral by 2030, there's going to be a real mixture of a pretty hefty capital investment and revenue support to make sure that strategy is in place. Um, these things don't come without a lot of time, a lot of effort, and unfortunately for Howell, a lot of capital resource. So um, we haven't we haven't really sort of identified figures yet because we really haven't got to that point where we'll understand it. And if you think about things like EV, whereas perhaps five or six years ago, that would have been us installing them throughout the county borough. You can already see businesses stepping out now, up now realizing the importance that it means to their business um, people like mcdonald's have installed them the supermarkets are installing them it's just making sure that that we have the wide variety that we need to support that ev strategy going forward and not just in terms of electric vehicles but we're also supporting the hydrogen event agenda we're one of the few authorities in fact we're the only one in wales really at this stage to have a hydrogen facility within the county borough which is the hydrogen center down on baglan energy park and we want to make sure we capitalize on that so it's just uh, two areas of risk that we've identified going forward but more than happy to take some questions thank you kerry and simon for your joint uh, delivery of the, the budget for this particular committee uh, i'll go to the questions now from pre-briefing and the first uh, councillor to indicate was councillor sean percy please thank you uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon and Kerry. Um, yeah, I got a few things here, a few comments and questions um, on the on the report. Um, uh, firstly, from Kerry's side, was on the um, connecting green infrastructure uh, funding. Just a comment on that one, really. I suppose um, this seems to have been a bone of contention with the staff every time I speak to them. Um, uh, it seems to be significantly affecting um, the ability to do some of the forward planning in terms of uh, the work for that team. Um, so I really hope they. Uh, one way or another, give us some, um, you know, some certainty on what's happening there soon, um, because it is really causing uh, difficulty. 
Um, so just moving on then to Simon's uh, side for a minute um, and the uh, decarbonisation. Um, I suppose it's a bit strange to kind of welcome a cost pressure, um, but I think uh, it is it is very welcome to see that we're we're um, you know thinking ahead to this now in line with our uh, our strategy on decarbonisation generally. Um, and I know we've we had some chats about this a little while ago, didn't we, Simon, about how we can move towards doing this and what the implications might be. Um, I guess. Where are we in terms of actually um, preparing the strategy and plan for the EV infrastructure? So obviously, I can see we've we've identified costs for rolling it out there, but the the decarbonisation strategy mentions actually producing a strategy on that, and I think that would be something that certainly for me, but perhaps the whole committee would be interested in looking at in terms of how we do plan looking forward to roll roll out the EV infrastructure. Um, so that's, I, I think I know there's a wider kind of decarbonisation update coming to the committee at some point that's mentioned in the report. Um, and for me, if there could be a little bit of focus on how that plan might be forming, that would be welcome from my, my perspective. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was on uh, the town centre officers. Yeah, again, really, really welcome. Um, I think everyone was a little bit baffled when you say there's the one officer is responsible for everything. Um, uh, it's Definitely tricky. And I, this is great because it does tie in, as you've said, to a lot of the um, issues we've raised in the Community Safety Committee as well. And I think having that presence there um, is, is just great because it takes some of the responsibility off the businesses to keep reporting the issues as well, um, which I think they will find um, particularly welcome um, if we've actually got some eyes and ears on the street um, picking up some of these problems early. Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of make a comment and welcome that in relation to the subcommittee's work on uh, community safety as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Simon, please. Um, in terms of the EV strategy, uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, it, it's it's a it's a one of the projects within our supporting innovation, low carbon growth, which is about leading on um, EV across the Southwest Wales region. Um, as part of that. We've been uh, liaising with um, the there's an EV strategy group set up for the Southwest Wales region. So we've linked into that now to make sure that we're key partners in that. Two strands to it, as I say, one is about our fleet and the decarbonisation of our fleet. And that is a relatively ring fence project, if you like, albeit that um, for the fleet to function properly, you also need to have a, um, a good infrastructure because otherwise we don't see vehicles getting stuck around the county borough for any reason. Um, but also this is, the, this is the public side of it as well. And one of the things we're looking at is having a strategy, uh, having a, a charging station in the Keys, for example, where if we're a little bit innovative about how we would set it up, it could deal with our staff, uh, our staff and our vehicles, but also be open to the public. If we put it onto the, we're talking about, for those of you who know the keys, the sort of runway section, if you like, if we put them on the bottom end of that, we could gate that off in the evenings, so we still protect the site, but we could allow people to come in. So we'll try and look at it, and, and we realise we don't have endless capacity, but um, we've also spoken to um, a company involved as well, uh, who did some fantastic work up in Dundee. I don't know if anybody have, have, have seen that online, but Dundee have got a an incredible infrastructure around EV, hydrogen, etc. Um, they really have moved it on exceptionally well, and they're probably the flag bearers for this, I would say, within the UK and how they've de provided decarbonisation within that town centre and the wider community. It really is, a, for example, all their taxis, I think, are virtually EV. A bit of carrot and stick, but that's how they've managed to achieve it. So I think there's a there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we're making some really good progress now. And as part of having the regional strategy, of course, we'll get our strategy in place to dovetail into that. Councillor Percy, you want to come back? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's great. I think I've got a few more little questions now. Um, sorry. Um, no, just obviously in terms of, like you said, now there's a regional kind of approach as well. And we're going to look at our strategy. I'm just trying to figure out in terms of um, the kind of time scales and how we're generating, how we're going to put together our strategy. Um, I'm just trying to figure that out, um, just in terms of how the committee can look at that that work going forward. Um, because obviously we're linking to things like tourism. We've mentioned 
Um, you know, there's no charging points on our Brabham seafront that we we operate. There's one in the the hotel, for example. Um, so we're going. This is going to have to tie into other strategies that the council is looking at um, as well. Um, so I was just wondering, in terms of the the commitment we've made in the decarbonisation strategy to prepare and publish the EV charging infrastructure plan, is that what that cost pressure that we're looking at in this report is working towards? And just trying to pick out on that specific point. Okay, we've um, obviously, as I say, EV the EV strategy is a, is a key element of the support and innovation low carbon growth program within the city deal. Um, that is going in very shortly and we're hoping for a decision on that in due course and hopefully that will provide the funding for the region. But we will dovetail our plan then is to so that our strategy doesn't conflict with what's going to happen across the region that we effectively draft our strategy at that point. So it's uh, it, it, it's very synergistic with the um, with the, the, the regional strategy. If for any reason that program was not to go through then of course we'll have to go it alone and try and make the best job we can of dovetailing it with our colleagues in Swansea, Carmarthen, etc. Um, so I would say we're probably looking at um, probably about six months, I would have thought, to get that into a reasonable position. Could be longer, We haven't because we, we can't do a procurement exercise until we get the go ahead. So it's, we're a little bit sort of in that limbo position at the moment, but we are making some good progress anyway. And as we've said, we are looking at where we can install them, where we know that critically they'll be needed anyway. I mean, the one thing here as well to bear in mind is we can't just install them randomly because obviously the capacity that these these um, these facilities take up puts significant significant pressure onto the grid. And in some areas, we just don't have that capacity. It would require new substations, etc. Um, for the trickle chargers, it's not a problem. But for those fast chargers, they do require an awful lot of juice. Um, and that's something that we are going to have a problem with. And the second thing that will come forward on that then is people saying, well, that's all well and good, but it's not sustainable. You need to have um, sustainable power going to it. Um, one of the things that we've identified within that strategy that we want to look at and in the regional strategy, we want some pathfinders is we know, as I mentioned earlier, for example, we've got some areas within valley communities, perhaps where the private sector might be reluctant to go, where you wouldn't have a McDonald's who's going to turn up and put a charger in or whatever. So those areas are areas where we probably think, feel that we need to concentrate on, whereas the private sector might be able to pick up stuff around the the, the sort of coastal areas they might not be so inclined to go to those hard hit areas. And I think there's a real opportunity there to link that up in with the renewables and through battery storage, whether as part of their community program that the renewables companies do, whether we can get EV charging points within those locations. Of course, the difficulties in a lot of our communities and particularly in the Valley communities, we have a lot of terrace streets. And so getting charging points for those who don't have rear access to their properties for whatever reason, becomes a bit problematic because you can't have trailing leads coming across pathways. And we've been approached by a number of individuals on that in that respect. And of course, at the moment, there isn't either the funding or the capacity really to start introducing on street charging points where you might only have one vehicle in the whole of the area. It becomes a very expensive process for one person to charge a vehicle. So we need you almost need the the um, the critical mass of EV vehicles, it is a bit chicken and egg because to justify putting EV points in, you kind of need a lot of vehicles. But effectively, what you have to do is you have to take an estimated guess at it and install them even where the demand isn't there. Thanks for that, Simon. Sean, did you want to come back? You hand this lap as a legacy. No, only really briefly, Chair, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah I just think there Simon you've picked up on how wide ranging this issue is and how it might have a disproportionate impact on valleys communities and various other things mm -hmm. and it's just why I'm keen that if there's a point where we can get this strategy at a draft stage to the committee to look yeah. at I think that would be really really important and we'll particularly if we're getting sucked into the wider region which is great um, we've got to make sure we've still got that local focus on some of those um, um, areas of, of Neath Talbot. So if there's any possibility of us getting a draft at some stage to have a look at, to scrutinise, and I, I'd really appreciate that, and I'm sure the rest of the committee would. Thank you. Yeah, good point, good point. Uh, Councillor Nigel Hunt, please. 
Oh, milk night. Thank you, Chair. Not um, right. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I'd just like to ask you how many um, electric vehicles we have in our fleet. I know that uh, there was only one or two when there was talk of uh, closing Junction 40, 41. Um, I remember there was only one or two uh, vehicles in our fleet. And I, have we had more than that now? Have we added more electrical vehicles to the fleet? And I'd also like to talk about the town, how much I welcome really the, the extra officers. Uh, for the town centres. I think Joe Hillier does a great job. She's a dynamic uh, worker officer for this council. And I think with help, we would really get benefit for that. And um, I know this, that there are security and uh, anti-social behaviour issues in, in all our town centres, which uh, we can improve on. But also like culturally, I think that they, they should be able to, I, I hope that part of their remit is to help. Like for instance, we have theatres in Ponte Dawi, Town Centre, in Neath Town Centre, in uh, Potawa Town Centre, in our own civic centre, and I know that um, there was a there was a, a play being written about um, about uh, Dick Penderin. Uh, it's called Iniquity Gamwedd, and uh, they were really hoping to show her uh, to premiere this on March the first in um, the Prince's Royal Theatre. Um, but obviously with COVID, uh, that, that's going to be hit back. But um, one of the residents in my ward, he, he played a lead role in a play in the Bristol Old Vic, and they'd done that sort of um, digitally. So they didn't have an audience in because of COVID restrictions, but they were able to fill it, film it, and people were able to buy tickets sort of online, and they were able to watch the play. And I think that with something like Iniquity Gamworth, which is, because um, it's premiere, it's a premiere of, of a play, there's this potential there to, to bring some life into into our theatres and possibly if we had town centre managers a part of the remit was the cultural um, to keep the cultural activity going on i think that would be very beneficial you know and think about we you know we're already got we're all questioning neat fair which is you know, it's fantastic it's the oldest fair in in wales i believe uh, neat fair you know maybe it can't go on because of because of covid um and you know are we going to be having other festivals now are we going to think of other festivals that maybe you don't need so many people to attend? So, like, if you had an arts festival, for instance, it would you you, you could have certain walls that were painted. You wouldn't really need to have th hundreds of people present while that was happening, but it would would leave an indelible mark on on buildings in Neath Talbot that would be appreciated for the whole year, as opposed to like um, a, a drinks a music festival, which is, listen, I'm all for music festivals. Again, can we do that digitally? Could we have it where bands were playing and could we promote it, you know, online, on a website or what have you? But what I'm saying is you could, certain festivals, you don't need many people in attendance, but it would leave a mark. That's what I'm saying. So would the town centre managers, are they, are, they, are they looking to improve the cultural um, output of, uh, or, or, of our town centres, our theatres, etc., festivals. I hope that's um, yeah. simple enough. What I'm, what I'm asking, uh, yeah. I, I just hope the town centre, these new officers, will be able to 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 to, to uh, encourage and develop these type of things. Okay. Uh, have a go at that one inside. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, if I'm honest. Uh, I think it's going to be the focus is going to be on the the day to day stuff that they'll be doing. They'll it'll unfortunately that's probably where we are at the beginning liaison with businesses. If over a period of time we're able to identify any capacity with them and these things, other things they can add on. Obviously they'll be helping out with um, things like the festivals that we've got in existence. Whether we can introduce more into the agenda potentially um, things like the um, as I said earlier things like the Nice Fair that's a huge, I mean, I'm not sure if um, members are aware, but it's a huge amount of manpower. The hours that go into that prior to the event happening and all the health and safety things that have to go through, etc. It's an enormous task. That's why we started around February time, um, because that's the kind of time that we need to prepare. Similarly, food and drink, uh, that's a little lighter than um, the um, Neath Fair, but it still starts probably around about um, May time, April, May, and we're starting to get that in place because you've got to book everything in advance. I mean, one of the things that we're doing for town centres as well is um, we one of the things we identified along the way was that um, putting on events within town centres is very difficult because you have to bring in generators because you need power all the time. 
So one of the things we've done is we're introducing electrical pop-up points in Teneath, into Port Albert, uh, Pondedawe, and in Glyneath, so that um, events can happen more easily. Because one of the first things happens when you try to get an event going is everyone says, yeah, yeah, but you need a generator. And then the cost means that you can't do it because it's too prohibitively it's too expensive. So we're trying to make sure that it's an easier process for smaller events perhaps to happen by putting that infrastructure in place. All right, Nigel. Yes, Steve, it's just uh, the electrical fleet, uh, I'll be vehicles. To oh, sorry, the, sorry, the electrical sorry. fleet. Um, we, perhaps going back um, six or seven years ago, I think we had one or two um, vehicles and they were um, not overly popular with staff, I have to say. Um, but they had a range of about 40 miles on a good day. So if you put the windscreen wipers on, you probably could get as far from the keys. You could get as far as, uh, you know, the keys and there's as the Talbot Civic and back without panicking. But they have got immeasurably better in the last few years and we've expanded the fleet. And I don't think, I mean, I've driven the, the ones that we've got and they're absolutely great. Um, and staff are happy to drive them anywhere now because they like regular cars. Um, Mike Roberts has been looking at increasing the amount of um, vans in the fleet as well. And he's introducing a range of those in in the next, um, I think they're coming in the next few months. Um, one or two of them may have arrived already. But as I say, as part of that, we have to put the EV charging structure in place because what we can't have is vehicles that we can't charge. So, and if we're bringing them back to base, obviously, if we've got 20 um, EV vehicles, they'll we need 20 slots, presumably, where they can charge overnight unless they're going on rapid charge. So, we're in the process of putting the infrastructure in place so we can expand that fleet. But we'll also be putting them into Port Talbot Civic Centre, for example, a, a charging point there, and um, obviously over in Neath as well, so that um, vehicles can be charged in various different points. Thank you, uh, Simon. Nigel, OK, yeah, thumbs up. Can I ask if any other member got uh, any questions on uh, this item, please? No, um, I just got a, a, a couple myself, if I may. Um, I certainly uh, uh, agree with some of the points raised by uh, 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 Councillor Percy. Uh, on page 36, Simon um, and Kerry, really, probably, the local development plan, I, I certainly agree with the context of the, what has been said and in the presentation, but I, I notice on their uh, proposed trajectory of spend and sure delivery of a replacement LDP. I think when we started to go into uh, the process of amending or, or slightly changing, the leader made a, a, a bold statement that we weren't replacing an LDP, we were just tweaking it to suit our needs going forward. So I just wondered, uh, is, is that a word that perhaps shouldn't have been put in there as replacement, but something different? Um, on the page, uh, rolling into 36 and 37, um, as it's quite rightly was pointed out uh, that off um, officer members should uh, today be wary of proposals for income generation or savings, they need to raise them not just here, of course, as I said earlier, they can raise them with a cabinet member, how well, and in, in the process. But I just w wanted to know that, uh, why I raised that point, is, which is quite an important point. As I said, on pages 36 and 37, we had not some resource ways and a well-being grant, and uh, it, it, it confirms that uh, they don't know if they're successful in grant uh, awards associated with the South Wales, West Wales Connection and Green. And, and further on, then infrastructure projects, budgets of 2.42 million over three years um, spend for the council. Again, we're reflecting that staff costs have got to be uh, found and monies that may be coming in that are not highlighted at this point. The NN, NNDR increased uh, the Crown Building, of course, and, and so forth. There's a lot of challenges in the report. But there's also money potentially that may come in before now and setting of the budget. And it's important to have a better understanding when we set in the budget if we are to have increased financial aid from various sources. Um, 
I certainly welcome, Simon, I, uh, it's been spoke about, I certainly welcome an extra officer uh, for the dis dis additional town centre, uh, moving up into Glyneath, as you said, and Ponte Dawi. Uh, they do exceptional work already. I, I, I don't know uh, uh, how our uh, officer has, has, over the years, done such an uh, excellent job. And, and I'd like you to take that compliment back to him from me personally and from this uh, committee because he's done a, an absolutely fantastic job uh, and especially now in these very challenging times. So um, I think our committee uh, budget, uh, when we look at our budget, are probably one of the luckiest committees to have. We, we, are, we are more regeneration and regeneration continues to a certain degree. Uh, obviously, we have to look at prudent uh, um, deficits and, and how we manage them. And I think we do that particularly well. So it's just those few points um, I wanted to raise because uh, it, it's, again, a, a moving live document in all of our committees. And, and if there's more money to come in, we need to be aware of it so that we can have that uh, proper scrutiny then going forward to the budget set in time. So um, I, I see Kerry uh, has put his hand up first. So I go to Kerry uh, Morris first, please. And then uh, uh, somebody else did have a hand up. I'm not sure who it was. Now it's come down. Kerry, anyway, over to you, Kerry. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll perhaps quickly respond to the couple of questions or points that were made sort of that came in my direction. In terms of the use of the term replacement, I, I, we're perhaps talking a little bit semantics, but I understand the point that that's been that's been made. The, the replacement LDP um, in the, is used in the context that um, obviously the current LDP will remain in place until we get to the point where we adopt the new LDP. So I think in, in that respect, I think that the use of the term replacement is used in the right context in terms of when we refer to the review of the LDP. Um, the, the reference that, that, that the chief uh, made in terms of the, the communication that was sent out to, to, to all members was the, the basis of that message was, I think the point was made that, um, yes, we will look at uh, the performance and how the LDP is performing in terms of policy implementation. And I think, yes, there will be some areas where the LDP is underperforming, and that's where the focus would be in terms of the review. But there will be parts of the LDP that are continuing to perform um, adequately and sufficiently well, and, and as the policies were initially intended. So. I think the review will, you know, those issues will emerge as the review progresses. Um, and so, um, you know, I think I think the message that the leader was given at that point was, look, it's it's not a case of, you know, ripping the entire plan up and start again. I think was the message that was being given at that point. But but in terms of the the reference to the replacement LDP in this report and it will be in subsequent reports, it is merely to to address the point that once adopted, it will replace. The current LDP. Uh, so hopefully that perhaps clarifies that that point. Um, in terms of the the Enro grant, yes, I mean it's, it's a point well made, Chair. My understanding is is that um, the the Enro grant and indeed other grants are being considered by the the Welsh Government Investment Panel. I believe the week commencing the twenty second of February. So we should have a better idea at, right at the end of this month of where we stand with the Enro grant. What I would say at this stage is that the initial grant was submitted uh, uh, for 2.4 million over three years. What is now likely to happen is that even if we do prove successful in getting the monies, um, it will effectively become a two year spend. And as a consequence, the, the budget and the projects will need to be reprofiled as a consequence because it's already it, it's been confirmed that whether we're successful or not, it will not go beyond uh, the end of um, sort of 22, 23 financial year. So, as I said, but but certainly the point is well made, Chair. And, you know, once the situation becomes a little bit clear with this grant, we can very much feed that into the, to the proposals as they come forward. Thank you for that, uh, Kerry, and for the clarity. Can I bring in a uh, cabinet member for finance then, Carla and Williams, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. There's been um, a number of um, points made around uh, NNDR and um, the relief fund, things like that. 
Um, it's very fluid at the moment. We're coming up to budget time, and obviously, um, the, the Welsh government will probably end up setting their budget before the pre Chancellor makes a statement on the third. Um, the Welsh government, I believe, will make their statement on the second. So, um, you know, it's 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 quite up in the air as to exactly what money the Welsh government will have. But even without that, this week the Welsh government have announced an extra thirty-three. Point two million pounds worth of funding for council tax collection, council tax reduction schemes, and additional business rates relief. Um, for the business rates relief, it's five point one million announced um, across Wales. So um, some of the things that we're worrying about at the moment may iron themselves out moving forward, but um, you know until we get details, etc., we may not know exactly what that is. We've been very very lucky. Um, that we're in Wales, to be honest, we're doing better than Scotland and England on our um, emergency funding for COVID and um, the ministers have worked very, very well with us over uh, the period, um, sticking to the budget. Um, we, um, we put in a bid on, because income generation loss has also been brought up, and you are right, Chair. Yes, I'd be more than happy to listen to income uh, generation ideas uh, or savings um, anytime. Uh, please feel free to call me, email me, Teams me, whatever. Um, but uh, just to say that this will be fluid, it will change. Um, and uh, every quarter we put in, if you like, a bill. Uh, for lost income and uh, other COVID expenses. There's also a mention there of the uh, test, trace, protect, uh, etc. Um, so these are things that I bring up on a regular basis when I meet with ministers in the uh, finance subgroup meetings. I had one yesterday. Um, and these are things that we can say, these are our pressures. This is where we, we need to look to see if we can get some extra funding. We may, we may not, but if we don't ask, we may not get. So um, just just sort of to put that out there is that what we're looking at now may change. It may not. Um, but as I say, the, the extra 33 million is very welcome from the minister this week. Um, she sent a letter out to all leaders um, and finance cabinet members this week. So um, just to pick up on some of the points made around funding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Carol. It's, it's, it's very important to have updated information as quickly as possible, and, and I appreciate that from yourself. Uh, it's it's I, very I, much is breaking news, Chair. Yeah, well, <laughs> there we are. That's probably why we haven't heard it from, from anywhere else yet. We've had it first. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Carol. It's important. And, and, and that's sort of the point I'm trying to emphasise. While uh, sometimes members can get confused whether today they have to sort of uh, make their views known. Of course, we are only dealing with our regen and, and uh, uh, development scrutiny committee this morning uh, in what we deal with. And uh, I'm sure members have given it a good airing. But I do appreciate your, your, the points you raised and uh, highlighting what members can do leading up to the very budget make, uh, making day at, at Council uh, in March. So thank you, thank you for that. It, it is really appreciated. Um, going back to the, the agenda item, uh, any other member, cabinet member or any, anybody want to make a, a, make a comment or a statement or a question? No? Uh, again, I think, as I said, I think this meeting it, it deals with the one of the better committees as far as budgets goes and always have done. So thank you for your input. I'll, I'll move on with the with the agenda. Um, in pre-briefing, members will be aware that I had a, a agenda item eight of the scrutiny forward programme. This item was put into the agenda this morning by accident. It should not be on the agenda. So I will move on to item nine and that is any urgent items. I have none. That would only remain for me to wish you a, a, have a lovely weekend. Uh, this hope Wales can beat Ireland. And uh, thank I you 